Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I have just finished the Chattanooga Campaign, and now I'm going to start the East Tennessee Campaign. After reunion Major General Ambrose Burnside's disastrous attacks at the Battle of Fredericksburg and the misery of what became known as Burnside's Mud March, the now defamed general offered his resignation. But United States President Abraham Lincoln refused to accept it, and instead sent Burnside west. He would command the Department of the Ohio, which encompassed the states of Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. The Midwestern states, because of their economic attachment to the southern states, possessed many anti-war citizens and politicians. As a result, Burnside would issue General Order No. 38, which declared that any person found guilty of treason will be tried by a military tribunal and either imprisoned or banished to enemy lines. In May 1863, a prominent anti-war politician named Clement Vallandigham held a rally in opposition to the war and spoke out against Abraham Lincoln and his administration. Burnside sent men to report on the rally, and it was their notes that provided evidence to the general that Vallandigham's speech went against General Order 38. The Ohio politician was placed under arrest. Additionally, Burnside sent troops to shut down the Chicago Times, which was running anti-war editorials. When Abraham Lincoln got word of these actions, he ordered the Chicago Times back open and used Burnside's General Order 38 to send Vallandigham into Confederate lines. The president went further and said that Burnside had exceeded his power by shutting down the Chicago Times. By June, the Tullahoma campaign began, and Union Major General William S. Rosecrans began maneuvering and pushing Confederate General Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee away from Murfreesboro and Nashville and Middle Tennessee in general. By July, the Confederate Army was in and around Chattanooga, defending the vital railroad hub. To combat the Union forces converging on Chattanooga, the Confederate government gave Bragg the Army of East Tennessee with about 17,000 men. The Army of East Tennessee exercised authority over East Tennessee with installations throughout the region, but when it was added to Bragg's forces, those units began to join the larger Army of Tennessee around Chattanooga. One group of men didn't join Bragg, however. Cumberland Gap, the well-fortified mountain pass, stood alone in East Tennessee. A brigade of soldiers under Brigadier General Archibald Gracie III was stationed at the Gap, but was sent to Bragg, leaving just a single brigade of 2,000 men under the command of Brigadier General John W. Frazier. Frazier admitted that some of the regiments under his command were suspect, and he feared they would not fight an engagement if the Gap was attacked. Nevertheless, he stood firm, waiting on word from Confederate Major General Simon Bolivar Buckner, to either join him at Chattanooga or withdraw toward Bristol, Virginia. By August, Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland began maneuvering against Bragg again, hoping to separate the Confederate Army of Tennessee from Atlanta and the rest of Georgia, and capture Chattanooga in the process. In conjunction with Rosecrans's movement, Burnside would invade East Tennessee to finally bring it under Union control. The region was heavily pro-Union, and after two years of Confederate authority, they would be happy to see Union forces occupy the area. Burnside formed up his newly created 23rd Corps, scattered throughout Kentucky, a little over 8,000 men, and began his invasion of East Tennessee on August 20th, 1863. Only light Confederate resistance remained in the region, except for the 2,000-man garrison at the Gap. His 8,000-man corps, over half of them mounted in a five-pronged attack, cut through the Cumberland Plateau of Appalachia, with a cavalry detachment led by Colonel Foster making it to Kingston, and under orders from Burnside to press on to Knoxville. Foster made it to Knoxville on September 2nd and captured a number of locomotives and train cars. Foster then drove out any Confederate resistance and chased them to the city's outskirts. Burnside and the main army reached Knoxville on September 3rd and completed the capture of the city. Before he left for Tennessee, Burnside gave Colonel John DeCourcy a brigade of men to act as the far eastern prong of the invasion force with the objective of capturing Cumberland Gap. To completely surround the Gap, Burnside sent Brigadier General James Shackelford northeast toward the Gap. Additionally, Burnside dispatched his troops throughout the region to push back any Confederate forces. By September 5th, both Shackelford and DeCourcy were putting pressure on the Gap by sending out skirmishers to harass Fraser's pickets. By September 8th, both brigades converged on the Gap. Fraser got conflicting reports from his superiors about whether to abandon his position or to stay, but before he could leave, the two Union brigades surrounded his position. Burnside became concerned about the Gap's capture and dispatched another brigade under Colonel Samuel Gilbert to the Gap, accompanied by Burnside himself. 
but this force would take a couple of days to arrive. In the meantime, de Courcy established communications with Shackelford on the south side of the Gap and attempted to fool Fraser into surrendering. Over a distant ridge, de Courcy marched a section of his brigade. The troops would descend into the valley and then secretly maneuver behind that ridge over which they had marched, then recross it. De Courcy hoped that Fraser would believe that more troops were arriving, but the ruse didn't work. To strain the food supplies of the Confederates, Shackelford sent his cavalry into the area just below the gap and attacked a force guarding a mill that the rebels used to grind their corn mill. Members of the 62nd North Carolina fled after the Yankees fired one volley and ran into the entrenchments in the gap, screaming that the entire Yankee army was after them. Shackelford's men burned the mill, further tightening the noose around Fraser's neck. Both brigade commanders sent requests for Fraser to surrender, but he refused them all. A few shots rang out from the Confederate earthworks, but no major fighting took place. When Burnside arrived with Gilbert's brigade and personally asked for Fraser's surrender, the Confederate commander gave in to Burnside, knowing that with Knoxville captured, his command stood no chance of survival, and he thought it best to prevent any senseless bloodshed. At 3 p.m. on September 9, 1863, the Gap's garrison formally surrendered. The regiments lined up on the Harlan Road, handed over their ammunition and weapons, and stayed there until the next morning, when the captured rebels began their march to Crab Orchard, Kentucky, where they would board a train destined for Chicago and the Camp Douglas Prisoner of War Camp. However, not all would make it to Chicago. During the night, many would slip away through the mountains and go on to fight against Union occupation of their region. As Burnside rode back to Knoxville, he set up a stable communication system and supply line from that city and the new Union garrison at Cumberland Gap. To keep the garrison in Union hands, he needed a stable connection to that city. Burnside now worked to assert control over the area. But his authority over the area would become contested as Confederate Lieutenant General James Longstreet would be sent north from Chattanooga, tasked with putting East Tennessee back under Confederate control.